Welcome to Researchers, podcast show about ideas and quest for knowledge. The U.S. government used AT&T's cooperation to spy not only on overseas communications, but to vacuum up virtually all of America's use of the Internet for years. Email, Googling, web surfing, you name it. Thanks to AT&T secure rooms like 641A in San Francisco, accessible only to those cleared by the NSA. And since I knew the NSA was there, it was obvious this was an NSA surveillance operation on the internet inside the phone company. But we basically called their bluff. We said, no, we're not, we're not going to give back the documents or be quiet because they were caught doing illegal things. And they really didn't want to sue me because if they did, we could sue them back for more details and more witnesses and so forth. And involved not just AT&T customers, but virtually every internet and telecommunications company and virtually all email and web traffic in the country. Without a warrant, without any mechanism for separating domestic from overseas, without separating suspect from citizen. Hello and welcome everyone to a third podcast show titled Researchers by your host Giuliano Marinkovic, which is broadcast exclusively only here on Omnitalk Radio. And besides other two podcast shows that I'm already running there, Uh, researchers will deal with specific uh, guests that will present new and important insights into a variety of subjects like advanced technologies, world affairs, history, scientific breakthroughs, and even some alternative uh, viewpoints. The bottom line is that the heart of our show will be researchers and their investigative work that they will relate to us. So I want to satisfy my personal curiosity, but uh, in the process of doing so, uh, I hope that it will be a service for uh, you too. Through the years, I was able to collect enormous archives uh, of different type of material that I was collecting. Uh, regarding different subjects and so on. I have a vast archive uh, of uh, radio shows, of my personal interviews. Some of them have never been published before. Or they were recorded for different TV shows where only the sound bites were presented to the audience. But you never been able actually to hear uh, the uncut uh, interviews. And uh, also some of these interviews that I have were done for magazines and the actual audio version has never been brought to the light of a day, right? Actually in the first episode I uh, decided to start with a trilogy first interview of three interviews that will deal with the same subject and that will be the nsa and the domestic surveillance uh, debate that uh, is going now for years thanks to a variety of whistleblowers i'm very connected with this subject personally during my career uh, one part of my life I was a member of the signal intelligence I was the shift commander of uh, the unit that had a mandate to intercept uh, radio communications so I know the technical side of this job but when we are speaking about domestic surveillance then we are speaking about technologies and methods when you are not using these means to extract the information from the enemy side that could be engaged in the war conflict but you are actually trying to gain intelligence from the domestic sources but in this case the domestic sources are those that are intercepted and that are used for different means. Could we find there any intelligence value there is debatable, at least if you are using a large sweep to intercept everyone in an attempt to find something of a value that could be related to only a couple of sources. It raises quite a debate from the point of legal regulations and so on. But this is just one part of the wider spectrum of subjects that I'm very interested in. 
And for the part one of this trilogy, I have a special guest. That's one of my archived interviews, but it was never been published in the full form. Uh, it was recorded back in November 2013 for the special TV show that I produced at the time that was dealing with cryptography and the history of signal intelligence and all the modern debates about domestic surveillance. And uh, I was actually trying to develop that TV show for years. And uh, the biggest problem that was happening was to find the good guests uh, that would speak about these subjects. And I could never find a deal guest for this show. And it was going for years and years. And uh, at the end, I told my host, you know what? We will not be able to achieve this show uh, with a good domestic guest who will openly talk about signal intelligence because when you go into these subjects, everybody thinks that you could maybe potentially breach some type of uh, security, uh, some type of intelligence procedures. So people would uh, talk about this subject very reluctantly, right? Uh, but um, since I had signal intelligence experience myself, I was involved uh, in such operations. And uh, since I didn't have any strings with uh, government institutions of this type anymore, I came to conclusion that I'm simply also the ideal uh, person to be a main guest in this show. So uh, the deal was struck. I was a guest. I only had to find good supporting guest, guests who could give a more expanded horizon to the issues. And I found three guests from United States. And the first guest from this archived interview will be uh, Mark Klein, former AT&T technician and whistleblower, uh, who back in the middle of 2000s, revealed the details how the AT&T installed the splitter in the so-called secret room where with the splitter it would be possible to monitor, capture and process domestic uh, telecommunications from customers of the AT&T, right? And it was a big story in the United States at the time and still is actually. And I followed uh, Mark's interviews. I was very interested to interview him myself. And it will be extreme pleasure to present you his views to the, tonight to you. And where he will explain why he decided to actually go public and to disclose uh, this secret NSA operation inside AT&T. And we will find out what was the outcome in the end for him personally and professionally. So we will be right back after this short music number, and then we will start with our interview, Mark Klein, former AT&T technician. And we are back, and I'm happy to welcome Mark Klein, who is now uh, on the line. Uh, Mark, I already introduced you briefly to our audience, but it would be great if you could expand the introduction a little bit more. So please tell us something about your biography that led you in the end uh, to your job at uh, at and I went to some technical schools in the early 70s in computers and electronics. And I got hired in an electronics factory, making computers. And then later in the 70s, another one that made early computer peripheral equipment like disk drives. And that was in California. And when I moved back to New York, where I grew up in 1981, I was hired by AT&T. And they put me directly into the computer room because of my background. And that's where I started my work for AT&T, basically maintaining and, and installing computer equipment and testing the lines that go in and out of the computer room. Uh, if I can also recall, you also had some education in history. Is, is that correct? In the 60s, originally, 1962, I started college as I went to an engineering school at Cornell. <clears throat> I wanted to be an engineer, 
And so that was the first year I was in engineering school. But then that was the beginning of the Vietnam War escalating. And they came to be a lot of political turmoil in the country and on my campus. And I became more involved in world issues. So first I switched from engineering to physics. And then from there, I went into liberal arts and studied history. And I ended up, ironically, I had a, got a degree in history in 1966 from Cornell. And then later I went back to um, get more technical training so I can get a job. <laughs> I think this is also very, uh, very important part of your biography because with the main incident that we will talk today, it allowed you to see the implications. Uh, so you are you had yes. a new uh, uh, social sciences and also technical aspect of your of your work. So yes, that gave me a, an unusual mix, I think, because the the engineering people tended to be just focused on technical stuff, and I was true. Throughout my technical work, a lot of technicians grew up just in that field of technical, you know, training and sort of blotted out the broader picture. But by, by, I guess, a stroke of luck, I had a broader view because of my history. We can move forward to... I think early 2003, and can you take us to, to those events? I think you are now working in San Francisco, right? Right. I was. I worked in two offices in San Francisco. The first one was not the one where the NSA worked, um, but they did show up there, um, and this was in 2002. That's when I first got wind of an NSA project inside the phone company, in this little small office, we got a little an email telling us somebody from the NSA was coming to interview somebody, a management person. It's a very, it was a very small office, so we had to let the door in, open the door for them. So this guy came and he interviewed this management technician, and we quickly learned that he was going to be working in a secret room that was being installed a few blocks away at a much larger AT&T central office. That, that was the office on 611 Folsom Street. And the following year in 2003, I was transferred to that office. And I, my job was to work mainly in the internet room. And so I, by quite by accident, I was pretty much on top of this secret NSA project. What was the m month of 2002 when those emails and that unusual visit arrived? When was that? Uh, my memory is a little fuzzy. I believe it was in the summer of 2002. And then in the fall, people were talking about this room that was being built in, 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 the, fall, in the other office because the regular technicians were not allowed in this room. And that's what gave it some extra attention. Um, only this one guy who was interviewed by the NSA could work in there. Okay, I guess so, he probably had the uh, security clearances to, to be allowed to work with them. That's exactly why they interviewed him, right, to give him clearance. Okay, uh, so as you said, you uh, later also uh, been transferred to 611 Felsom Street, and so you had more interaction with the staff there and uh, all the process that they are trying to build it. So maybe a few of those events that you recall during this era. Well, when I arrived at 611 Folsom Street, um, I was working in the internet room, and I was taking over from another man who was retiring and he told me about the job and he also pointed me to a couple of technical documents that were lying around. These were engineering 
documents that basically showed where a specific cabinet was installed in the internet room. This was referred to as the splitter cabinet. And this was on the seventh floor. And I also found a third document that was lying on a router, which was related to the other two. And the third document revealed some of the equipment inside the secret room. So one day I was sitting down at my desk and I looked at all the documents and I figured out what they were doing and I was very upset. Uh, basically the splitter cabinet, its job, the splitter, which is basically just a glass prism that splits a laser light beam into two parts. And by doing so, it copies the data going through. So the splitter was copying the internet data, sending a perfect copy down to the secret room, which was on the floor below the internet room. And the document showed the wiring of all this. It was quite unambiguous. The document showed the setup. It showed where the splitter cabinet was placed. It showed the wiring that the splitter cabinet was connected to the secret room. So the engineering documents revealed for anyone who had some technical understanding, uh, you could figure out that this was a, a surveillance operation. And since I knew the NSA was there from what I'd heard previous, it was obvious this was an NSA surveillance operation on the internet inside the phone company. And I knew, as soon as I figured this out, I knew that was totally illegal. It had to be. There could not be legal warrants for what they were doing. If you know the Fourth Amendment to the American Constitution requires warrants for surveillance on people, warrants have to be very specific, naming names and, and things to be collected by the government. And in this case, they weren't doing anything specific. They were just sweeping up everything that came across the fiber. Well, there couldn't be any legal warrant for that. So I knew it was totally illegal on those grounds. And I remembered from what happened back in the 70s. In the 70s, there was a big scandal when Congress revealed that the NSA had been uh, spying on the domestic population on anti-war dissidents uh, at the behest of Presidents uh, Johnson and later President Nixon, who resented and hated the anti-war protesters. So they asked the NSA to spy on, on the protesters and collect information on them. Well, that was totally legal back in the 70s. And the Congress, in the wake of the Watergate scandal when Nixon was spying on the Democratic Party headquarters. Congress did an investigation and revealed this stuff about the NSA, um, drawing up a list of people to spy on and using their apparatus, their technical means to do so. So, that was known in the 70s, and that scandal produced a special law passed by Congress in 1978 called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA. And that basically said any domestic surveillance has to be approved by this special secret FISA court. Otherwise, it's illegal. And the intention of this creation of this court was to rein in the president from doing illegal domestic spying. So I remembered all that scandal from the 70s. So here it was, here it was 2003 under Bush, and I discovered the NSA was installing what was obviously an illegal surveillance apparatus. Furthermore, the more I looked into it, I talked to the technician who worked in the room and he revealed that he, 
his job was not only this room, but several other rooms on the West Coast, Seattle, San Diego, Los Angeles, San Jose. And the documents revealed that was another room in Atlanta. So there you have already five or six rooms. So by logic, there must have been, must have been at least that many and probably more. When we showed these documents to an expert engineer who was familiar with AT&T's network, he estimated, he confirmed that this was evidence of illegal surveillance. And he estimated, estimated that they probably had 15 or 20 such rooms spread across the network just to cover everything. Amazing, Mark. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more details about the uh, device itself? So it was a splitter uh, connected to an optical cable. Was there any amplifying included? And I think that you also mentioned that there was another device connected, so-called NERIS for semantic analysis, uh, right? Yes. The, uh, the splitter itself doesn't have amplification, but the distance was so short you, a signal, a light signal, can go very far in a fiber optic cable before it needs any amplification. It's not like copper. So this was only going from the seventh floor down to the sixth floor. So it didn't need amplification. It would just go down to the sixth floor. And then it would go into the equipment there. And in the sixth floor secret room, the document showed there was a special piece of equipment called a NARUS. That's the name of a company, N-A-R-U-S. NARUS STA-6400. STA stands for Semantic Traffic Analyzer. And that gives you a hint of what it does. It looks inside the content of the data, semantics, semantic traffic analyzer. It reads the content of the of the traffic and it's programmable. So you can program it to collect anything you want. You might want to collect, you know, by addressing information. Uh, say email from from you and me. Or I might collect email from a certain city. Or I might look at the content and you might ask it to look at any content uh, that discusses national security agency. It's programmable and very flexible, very fast. And it can look at all this millions, billions and billions of bits of data going by every second. And it could select out every second, whatever you program it to. Very sophisticated piece of equipment. And then the, da the documents revealed that then they had their own separate dedicated channel to take whatever they collected and send it elsewhere, presumably back to uh, Fort Meade, which is NSA headquarters. Well, the next step of the story is also pretty interesting. Uh, I guess you later went, went to retirement and decided at some point to, to step out. But it was the story that nobody wanted in the beginning. So can you give us the chronology about aftermath? Well, I, when I retired in 2004, I, I, was a, I took the documents with me, but I was afraid to do anything with it because was, it was a scary time and the government was being very repressive. They had already thrown into jail without charges an American who they arrested on American soil and threw him in a military brig. That was Jose Padilla. You can look up his name. So it was scary, so I didn't do anything at first. But in December 2005, New York Times revealed that Bush was doing warrantless wiretapping, not getting any warrants, using the phone companies to spy on millions of people. So this was already the first crack in the government wall of silence. So I figured, okay, well, I have the evidence on that. Uh, um, so the next month in January 2006, <clears throat> I took my documents and tried to 
show them to various people to see if I could get it publicized. I found in that month a very friendly civil liberties group, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, who by chance were already preparing a lawsuit against AT&T because of other things that AT&T was doing. And they were very excited and I worked with them for some weeks and months. After a few weeks, they asked for my documents. I gave them my documents. Um, in the meantime, I was trying to get the media to publicize this. And in that same month, uh, around late February, no, February 2006, in San Francisco, I met a reporter for the Los Angeles Times who was very excited. And he, I worked with him for weeks by email and phone and in person. I gave him the documents. He was promising a big front page story. That would have been the first big exposure. But after a few weeks, he, he called me up and said, well, we've, our top guy here wants to first talk to the director of national intelligence. <laughs> as soon as I heard that, I knew they were running scared and they're going to kill the story. Eventually, that's what happened. They talked to the director of national intelligence. I don't know what happened in their converse, conversation, but you can be sure the DNI, as he's called, um, told them, don't run this story. Uh, it will threaten national security. So the LA Times backed out. And this was in late February, early March, 2006. So that was my most dangerous moment. I was worried here I still had no publicity. And now the government knew there was someone from AT&T and they probably had my name by now shopping these documents. I was afraid I might be disappeared, which is not inconceivable. So I went to the New York Times in late February 2006. They were very excited and we talked and and then I spoke to James Risen and Eric Lichtblau. They were the ones who did the earlier story. And then there were some weeks of silence. And I began to worry that they might not publish it because maybe they're under pressure too. And then what, what turned the tide, because the media seemed sort of interested, but afraid and not sure if I was real and the government was making threats, you know. Well, meanwhile, I was, the Electronic Frontier Foundation asked me to write up an affidavit, which they would file and join with their lawsuit. So I wrote up a three page or four page affidavit or declaration that was called, describing what I knew. And as they were going down to file it with the court, this is in late March, 2006. Suddenly the government jumped in and said, wait a minute, we want to see those documents first. This was a bit of a surprise because we were filing a lawsuit against AT&T, not directly against the government. So the government said they wanted to look at these documents because they thought they might contain highly classified information, in which case, they'd have to put the documents in a super secret compartmented place, which, which very few people, not even the judge could easily look at. So they spent a few days looking at it. And then they handed the documents back and said, okay, you can file this under ordinary court seal, not the super secret seal. So that was good for us in several ways. That, meant, first of all, that it wasn't classified documents, so they couldn't try to cover it over with some classified secret, secret uh, legal, um, you know, framework. But it also, by the government doing that, they probably shot themselves in the foot because that attracted the attention of all the media. 
suddenly the media realized, hey, this is probably real, a real deal. We should look at this. And they started calling. I suddenly got a flood of calls in April 2006. And then the New York Times broke their silence and finally published an article, a nice article, about my documents. Uh, and they also published an editorial titled AT&T and the NSA. And, and the article that they published described how they showed my documents to four experts on the internet and on, on AT&T in particular. And all four experts agreed this was unusual, probably illegal uh, evidence of government surveillance inside the phone network. So that gave me legitimacy and suddenly we got a flood of media attention. Um, we still had some problems down the line I could go into a little later that in the same year, even though we got a lot of attention. In the fall of 2006, we were, we were wondering, we wanted to get on national TV with this. Um, and we got an offer from 60 Minutes, which you probably are aware is a major American, yeah. you know, CBS inter yeah. interview show that, yes. Uh, and they would have been good at covering, interviewing me and giving national attention to this. So we accepted their request. They flew me to New York in September 2006. I was interviewed by S Steve Croft, who you'll, you'll find on, if you look up on their web, website, is one of their major anchors. It was a good interview. Then we waited and waited and waited and waited, and they never aired it. And they wouldn't give us an explanation of why it wasn't being aired. So I thought, and that was particularly annoying because we had given them an exclusive, namely, we agreed not to talk to anybody else on TV about this until they first aired their interview. So in the fall of 2006, while the American election was going on, I couldn't say a word about it. Very annoying. So it actually objectively helped Bush. Um, in the end, by, by December 2006, we gave up on 60 Minutes. And in January 2007, we went to two major networks that, that did air interviews. That was a, a ABC Nightline, uh, with Brian Ross and PBS Frontline with Hedrick Smith. And they both did nice interviews that were posted online. You can still find them online. Uh, you can look for my website. I have the links to all these interviews. Um, so, so that was a funny thing that happened with 60 Minutes. But we still nevertheless got tremendous coverage after that with the media. In one uh, moment, also AT and T wanted to to get uh, documents that you have back, and they they tried. Can, can you tell us a little bit about this incident that they tried to pull? Yes, after I my affidavit went to the court, and the court had a hearing. Um, AT and T's response was to come at me and demand demanding the, that I give back the documents and not speak about this anymore. And the implied threat was that they would sue me because uh, I had basically stolen their documents, right? Uh, it, was a, they were, it was labeled AT&T proprietary. Um, but we basically called their bluff. We said, no, we're not, we're not gonna give back the documents or be quiet because they were caught doing illegal things. And they really didn't want to sue me because if they did, we could sue them back 
for more details and more witnesses and so forth. They didn't, they didn't want more court problems. They wanted to get out of court. So they never sued me. So, so after that, I didn't have any legal problems with them. The government didn't come after me because they didn't have any legal basis to do so, which wouldn't necessarily stop them. But in this case, it would have been harder because I, I didn't have any classified documents and I didn't have a security clearance so they couldn't accuse me of breaking any oaths of secrecy that people who sign security clearances have to sign an oath swearing never to talk about it. Well, they couldn't get me on that because I, I never signed any such documents. So as far as legal problems, that was, I was free of that. Yeah, we can now move to the resolution of the whole story. Can you tell us what happened with the lawsuit of Electronic Frontier Foundation? And I guess somewhere down the line of all these events, uh, immunity for telecommunication companies was granted to them, and uh, that stopped the whole thing. Yeah, well, at first the government, who, whose lawyers came into court alongside the at t lawyers, the government simply tried to get the case dismissed against AT&T by stating it was a matter of state secrets. And often when the government does that, the judge gets scared and immediately dismisses the case without even looking at it. This particular judge, though, had some backbone. And he said some nice things. He said, basically, no, I'm not going to dismiss the case on those grounds. Uh, if there's any secrets here... This court can keep secrets. And anyway, the basic outline of this is hardly a secret since President Bush has been boasting about it just about every day. And that was true. Bush and his cabinet were boasting about the, uh, once, it, once the, the spying program became public knowledge, Bush would just boast about it and defend it as necessary for your safety. And at the same time, he would distort it and try to minimize it by claiming that they're not looking at Americans, they're just looking at a few foreigners. Um, but that meant the case could go forward. So the government got scared. And so that began that began a two-year fight while the government and at t were trying to get the case dismissed and EFF was trying to get the case to go forward. And during this time, the case was on, on appeal to a, another, a higher court where the government was trying to get a dismissal. So the government went to the Congress. And in 2007, we went to Washington, me and the lawyers from EFF, because the government, um, and this was a Democratic Congress, ironically, a Democratic Congress was basically trying to cover for the Republican Bush. And a lot of the Democratic leaders, including in the end, well, including Barack Obama in the end, uh, but people like Dianne Feinstein were pushing a bill to give immunity to the phone companies so that they could not be prosecuted for this secret program that nobody could even talk about. And they couldn't even admit there was any crime here, but they wanted Congress to give them secret immunity for a secret crime. <laughs> Pretty unusual. Um, so we went to Washington to lobby against this immunity bill. And the argument went on, went on for months. Barack Obama at this time was a senator, and he pretended to be on the, le on the left wing, and he said that he would filibuster ends against any bill uh, with immunity for the phone companies. So he pretended to be against immunity. So the bill of arguing drag, dragged on into 2008. And when the final time came in July 2008, Obama switched sides and came out for the immunity. And it passed finally in 2008 and that gave immunity to the phone companies. So then the following year, 2009, 
the judge dismissed the case against AT&T. However, the legal fight hasn't died because in the, during that time, EFF also filed another lawsuit against the NSA directly, a lawsuit against the government, the NSA, and George Bush, and all the, all the leading government officials involved in this program. That case is known as Jewel versus NSA. Um, and that case is still alive. It just had a hearing a couple of months ago where the government tried to get some motions to throw out some stuff and the government motions failed. So the case is sort of inching forward, that legal case against the NSA. And unless something happens, it might actually get a hearing next year. So that's the legal status. Meanwhile, there's a lot of political turmoil now because of Edward Snowden's revelations, which has stirred the pot up um, again and created new splits in Congress. Some Congress people want to rein in the NSA, although the White House does not. Uh, what was the, the request of the EFF uh, lawsuit? They, did they want to uh, AT&T to stop with the collection of this traffic or did they, they requested something else in the lawsuit? I think they just wanted a ruling that this kind of surveillance was illegal and it should be stopped. Oh. They should get an order to stop this, that kind of surveillance, oh, thank which you. was basically mass dragnet surveillance of everybody. Yeah. Uh, I j just wanted to add, following with, with all these uh, uh, revelations and so on, also I did uh, read on many other sources that NSA, after the internet era, had many problems with collection of the data where the traffic over the satellites in Marsat and so on was much, much lower. So, so I'm interesting that uh, is there uh, uh, traffic from the uh, optical cables? Are there any uh, radio relays uh, where some portion of this traffic can be uh, brought over microwave telephone towers or satellites or because of the speed and capacity it can be done only over optical cables? I don't know how they divide up the data traffic, but my general understanding is the capacity of fiber optic cables is vastly bigger than satellite. And so most traffic would go through cables, such as the transatlantic cables that go from North America to Europe, and which as Snowden has revealed, are tapped into as they pass through the UK and the, the GCHQ in, in England taps into those cables. But that's vastly more capacity than you can, you can get from the satellite, from what I understand. Satellite is, in some ways, an older technology and more limited in the capacity. And, and for then, can you present us uh, your book, uh, how it was received? And were you the first person who actually stepped out and talked about these subjects in public? I believe there was another, another NSA guy named Russell Tice. I think he came out in 2005 after he was forced out of the NSA, but they tried to um, uh, smear him as a person with mental problems. And he didn't have, as far as I remember, any documents with him. He mainly talked about what he saw. And so they, the media didn't give him good coverage. So he didn't get much coverage early on. But you can find him more recently, had some coverage on Boiling Frogs, you might be familiar with that show. Russell Tice, I think he preceded me, but I think I was the first one maybe that had the um, actual documents that showed what they were doing. Of course, uh, um, William Binney is the horse's mouth as far as I'm concerned, because he was a mathematician who designed the surveillance apparatus, and he knows 
how it works, how they collect all that stuff. In 2009, I published my book, which gave some um, coverage of the whole picture. Wiring up the Big Brother machine was the name of my book. Um, so I'm sort of a part of the part of the picture, I guess you might say. Um, but Snowden has certainly revived the whole controversy in a much bigger way because while they tried, government tried to dismiss me as a nobody who didn't have NSA credentials, they couldn't do that with Snowden. And they couldn't do that with William Binney either. And Snowden has revealed stuff that I never even conceived of, uh, like the um, prison program to tap into everybody's personal accounts on Google and Yahoo and tapping into the transatlantic fiber optic cable, which is a big deal. That's a large part of the world's traffic. Yeah, it seems they were able to compensate the, the lower traffic of the satellite in, in later years. Okay, Mark, okay, and for the end, if you have any message for our viewers, if you think that we, there was something that we left out and that you still think it is important, here's your mic. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks. I'm just, all I can say is um, it really takes active people constantly on the alert to defend democratic principles because if there's no active opposition inside a country, the government tends to accumulate just by its natural desires, accumulate more powers, more than it should have. And there has to be some resistance to that or else you end up with a dictatorship. Beautifully said. Uh, thank you for your activism. Th thank you so much and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Take care. It Bye. was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And that was all for our first episode. As I said, this was our archived interview with Mark Klein from 2013. The next episode will be the second part of our uh, series uh, NSA and Domestic Surveillance. And there you will be able to hear the interview with uh, William Binney, the NSA whistleblower. And the subjects will continue on the same note and it will be an uh, interesting addition to all the information that we heard today from uh, Mark Klein. If you like the show, please subscribe, please comment, send your suggestions for possible future guests and what will be the other subjects that I am preparing for you. Well, let's leave it now as a surprise. You'll soon learn about it. Thank you so much for your patience and for being today here with me. And until the next episode, I send you all the best wishes. <laughs>